Hello, welcome to Arise Build Africa. This is a youth forum. Here we discuss issues about Africa and we discuss ways Africa can move forward. Many times I ask myself why Africa is what it is today. Is it because its leaders are not dedicated enough to put policies in place or actions in place to make the continent grow? Or is it a sheer fact of wickedness? You and I have to process this for ourselves. Because you go to any of the African countries and you find a unique resource which is in global demand. But most of those countries with such unique resources are even the poorest. And why is that so? Why should Africa be even classified among the poorest continents? Or even the poorest continent, let me put it that way. It is so sad. In recent um, documentary by CNBC, they were talking about Zimbabwe's lithium. And it is so sad. Lithium is in high demand as the world tries to um, move from fossil fuel to electric cars and some of these electric gadgets. You know, and lithium is the sole source or it's, it's one of the main um, resources for, for high quality batteries. So if you have this resource which is in high demand now, you should be rich. You should be able to use or leverage that to do something for your people. Recently, Ghana had um, Ghana discovered lithium, and they've given it out to a foreign company to mine. I'm not against that, but what will the returns be? Is it going to be to the benefit? Of the people or it is just going to be exploited to benefit few this is really typical issues that the continent has faced so many times the discovery of natural resources but in this documentary it is all about Zimbabwe and it's all about why all eyes are on Zimbabwe's lithium industry. So Zimbabwe has been mining lithium for 60 years. And the government estimates that its Chinese-owned Bakita mine, which is located 300 kilometers south of the capital, Harare, has about 11 million metric tons of lithium resources. Just look at that, 11 million tons. In an effort to reclaim the control of its mineral resources, Zimbabwe passed the Base Mineral Export Control Act in 2022, just last year, which banned the export of raw lithium. So this is a good strategy. Um, mine the lithium and process it. Don't export the raw um, resource. Right. So mining it in a country in a way I mean um, in a way benefit the country because on the supply chain um, its mining is going to create some kind of um, employment opportunities for its people All right so you don't send the raw uh, material out you mine it which you engage maybe some local content and then you process it which will also um, definitely engage some local content. So that's that's a good move. But what happened? However, some Chinese-owned companies that are developing mines and processing plants in the country were exempted from this ban. 
so the government actually banned export controls right in 2022 but some chinese based companies were not or they were excluded with the world going electric african countries will play a critical role in the electric vehicle battery supply chain in 2009 china overtook the u.s as africa's largest trading partner and accounted for 70 percent of the global electric vehicle battery production capacity leaving the u.s behind so this is a great opportunity for africa especially zimbabwe ghana mali those countries who have discovered lithium to take advantage of it and then make their countries rich and chase the fortunes of their people so if you are ready just take some few minutes to look at this documentary just try as much as possible to watch it to the end and then see for yourself what is going on with Zimbabwe's lithium production. As the second largest continent, Africa is home to 30% of the world's mineral reserves. It holds 40% of the world's gold and at least 90% of its chromium and platinum. It also has the largest reserves of cobalt, platinum, uranium, and diamonds. With the global demand for batteries rising and the search for new sources of energy, the world is reliant on minerals from African countries. But many African leaders are looking to reclaim control of the continent's resources. We need to process our lithium and get quality. Lithium is a critical component found in electric vehicle batteries, and reserves have been discovered throughout the continent, with Zimbabwe, Namibia, Ghana, Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Mali all having notable supplies. Most automakers have announced a transition to electric, meaning the demand for batteries and the minerals in them is going to skyrocket. In 2021, the world mined 540,000 metric tons of lithium. By 2025, the demand is expected to triple to 1.5 million metric tons, and by 2030, 3 million metric tons. Zimbabwe has been mining lithium for 60 years, and the government estimates that its Chinese-owned Bikita mine, located 300 kilometers south of the capital Harare, has about 11 million metric tons of lithium resources alone. Mining in Zimbabwe is very politicized, it's very securitized, and sometimes it's militarized. In Zimbabwe, there are more than 80 state-owned Chinese enterprises, which have amassed a total of $10.4 billion in investments and contracts in the country from 2005 to 2020. Meanwhile, the U.S. has fallen behind and relations with the nation have been shaky. I think they've already taken Africa for granted for so long. And I think now is the time to say maybe it's time to wake up. In the future, African countries like Zimbabwe will play an important role in the mining of battery mineral resources. In 2020, Zimbabwe was the sixth largest producer of lithium, and the country is expected to become one of the world's largest lithium exporters. CNBC explores Zimbabwe's mining sector to find out why China has a stronghold on the country and why it matters to the U.S. Whoever comes to invest in the country must be told that, number one, You've come to Zimbabwe and respect the Zimbabwe people. The world is changing and we need to get there. With or without us, Africa will move forward. Uh, Africa has other options. Zimbabwe is rising step by step, brick by brick, and stone upon stone. No one, no one can stop that movement. Zimbabwe is home to over 60 different minerals, including all five of the critical minerals needed to build electric vehicle batteries, lithium, cobalt, manganese, nickel, and graphite. Minerals play an important role in the economic growth of Zimbabwe, accounting for 60% of the country's total exports, with the mining sector contributing to 11% of the national GDP. In 2023, it's expected to grow by 6% and is valued at 12 billion US dollars. Mining has played a critical role in terms of sustaining growth in the economy and we've seen a lot of investments within the mining sector 
over the past few years. For us to realize the full potential from the mining sector, it means we have to move up the value chain. Zimbabwe primarily mines gold, platinum, and diamonds, but lithium prices have skyrocketed. The price in May of 2022 was seven times higher than the price at the start of 2021. Zimbabwe is looking to capitalize off this increase, and the country could potentially meet 20% of the world's demand for lithium once it fully exploits its known resources. Lithium has been discovered in many parts of the country close to the surface. The villagers have been mining that lithium and selling to merchants. And that helps in alleviating rural poverty. Chinese companies YU Cobalt and Sino Mine Resource Group own both the country's most important and resource-rich lithium mines. When we invest in the Chinese and allow them to come and do what Zimbabweans are capable of doing, we are building China, not Zimbabwe. Zimbabweans are saying, leave room for the Zimbabwean people where the Zimbabweans are able to mine and invest in the local economy. CNBC reached out to the Chinese embassy in Zimbabwe, which declined to comment on this statement. The strategy of most of the new investors in the lithium mining industry is to go towards mining, sorry, battery grade um, lithium. I don't think the Chinese compete with artisanal and small-scale miners. The Chinese serve as, as a middleman. Artisanal miners were doing the mining, and then they would sell to the Chinese mining companies. So there was some kind of a relationship, a working relationship. Artisanal mining, or small-scale mining, plays a critical role in the livelihood of over one million Zimbabweans. It's a largely informal method of mining where individuals use basic tools to extract minerals. It's estimated that the government has lost nearly $2 billion in minerals smuggled across the border through artisanal mining leakages. We cannot, as a country, continue to be exporting primary products, including concentrates and oils. In December 2022, the country passed the Base Mineral Export Control Act, which banned the export of raw lithium. However, companies that are developing mines and processing plants in Zimbabwe are exempt from this ban. This includes Chinese firms YU Cobalt, Sino Mine Resource Groups, and Changxing Lithium Group, which have invested $678 million into lithium projects. Any government in the world was bound to react when your resources are just flying in, in, in all directions. However, the lithium concentrate is still being exported lawfully out of the country. So I think government simply wanted to control the lithium that was being extracted by artisanal miners, which was not being accounted for, and it was being smuggled out of the country. Artisanal miners were the worst affected by uh, the ban because they had already accumulated loads of raw lithium that they were preparing to sell, and they couldn't sell their lithium. They suffered more than any other. Uh, person. With the new act passed, Zimbabwe is looking to capitalize off this price surge, signaling to the world that it's open for business, but only if it benefits the country. There are two narratives. The political narrative that mining is the savior of the economy, and then the grassroots narrative, which says mining is undermining our livelihoods. And we sit in between. We want to see mining contribute to the economy, but not at the expense of the Zimbabwean people. And we say we are friend to all and enemy to none. In 2009, China overtook the U.S. as Africa's largest trading partner, growing from $121 million of traded goods in 1950 to $10.5 billion in 2000, and now $254 billion in 2021, compared to the U.S., which sat at $64 billion in 2021. China now accounts for over 70% of global EV battery production capacity, and with over 20 years of consistent commitment to African nations, it has placed itself in the right position to access the resources needed to continue this trend, leaving the U.S. to play catch-up. In December of 2022, U.S. President Joe Biden welcomed 49 African leaders to Washington, D.C. for the country's second U.S. African Leaders Summit and its first since the Obama administration. The United States is all in on Africa's future. This summit was a critical step needed to reestablish U.S.-African relations, which were rocky in the previous administration. It took eight years to hold this summit. This came as 
a reset in relationship between the United States and African countries. It also was an important moment for the U.S. to signal to Africans that they take Africa seriously. Zimbabwe will use the meeting to re-engage the United States of America. We hope the USA will be forthcoming. However, noticeably missing from the summit was Zimbabwe's president, Emerson Mnangagwa, who was not invited and has been under U.S. travel sanctions brought on by allegations of corruption and human rights abuses since 2002. In his place, Foreign Affairs Minister Frederick Shava attended. That itself, the fact that he came, is also still um, a signal that the U.S. is interested in keeping the door open with Zimbabwe. While the U.S. pledged its commitment to Africa, the reality is tensions have been building for a long time. The U.S. has been under pressure from the African Union and the Southern African Development Community to lift sanctions against Zimbabwe. These sanctions were enacted after then-Zimbabwe President Robert Mugabe launched a controversial program in 2000 that redistributed land from Zimbabwe's white minority population to its indigenous black population. The U.S. came to the summit with a trust deficit. America has not been consistent in the way that it engages with Africa. The problem is Af America tends to go through European former colonial powers to engage Africa. That is problematic because these countries are sovereign, independent countries. Following the sanctions, many Western governments pulled aid, and companies like Anglo-American, which owns Zim Alloys, one of the country's largest producers of chrome, sold its stake, leaving room for outside investors. Plus, the country still faces hurdles when it comes to doing business. Zimbabwe currently has the world's highest inflation rate, peaking at 283% in 2022, and lending rates can be as high as 45%. Western investors have been a bit uh, more skeptical when it comes to investing in an environment like Zimbabwe, where there are a lot of risks. But of course, the, the Chinese have decided to take the risks and, uh, and, and put in resources. The dominant players in the mining industry pr prior to the 2000s have been uh, the Western companies. When sanctions were imposed on Zimbabwe by the US and EU, Zimbabwe decided to change its foreign policy and came up with what it called the Look East policy. Western companies were pulling out. Russian and Chinese companies found a way to get in, especially in the extraction of strategic minerals. The Chinese have a long-standing history with Zimbabwe and were one of the first countries to recognize Zimbabwe diplomatically when it gained independence in 1980. The Chinese have played for keeps. They showed up in Africa in the 50s during the independence movement and stuck with those countries regardless of where the country stands on the political spectrum. The United States, our relationship is not always permanent and the Chinese are just consistent in that way. If you leave and you try to come back 10 years later, where that void that you left will be filled by somebody else. So it's, cons it's important that we be consistent. And many of Zimbabwe's mines are Chinese owned, including the Bikita mine, which is the largest lithium mine in the country, and the Arcadia mine, which is considered to be one of the world's biggest hard rock lithium resources. Zimbabweans are capable of mining lithium that is close to the surface. They can do that. But the Chinese have been competing with the Zimbabweans even in areas where Zimbabweans can do it. The same happened with diamond mining. Zimbabweans discovered the diamonds. They started mining. The government sent the military and they brought in the Chinese. So there is this feeling among Zimbabweans that the government is preferring the Chinese over its own citizens. Chinese investments are pouring into Zimbabwe. In 2022, Chinese mining companies Xing Shang, China Nonferis, and Yu Cobalt invested nearly $1.5 billion into Zimbabwe. In the same year, Sino Mine Resource Group announced its plan to expand its current production at the Bikita Mineral Mine by investing $200 million into building a new lithium plant. Some of the Chinese companies that are mining in Zimbabwe, they are buying companies that already exist, that were owned by, say, Australian companies or American companies. And they are taking over from these old mining companies. While the government is signing deals with Chinese investors, Zimbabweans aren't naive to the issues that come with accepting Chinese money. The negotiations of the contracts are done in secret. Often, the national interest is lost in that secret negotiation. The first thing we need to do is to be transparent. We don't know the kind of concessions that um, 
African countries are actually giving out to the Chinese. I think there's been a, a lot of opacity around Chinese investments on, on the African continent. It's clear that the resources belong to Zimbabwe, not the West nor the East. But how can Zimbabwe exploit its full potential? Magu proposes an OPEC-like cartel where mineral-rich countries band together to regulate the price and extraction of minerals such as lithium. Zimbabwe produces minerals. We need to control the prices of our minerals. We need to control the marketing of our minerals. We also need to engage other countries, even forming cartels. We need to identify which other countries produce lithium in the world. Let's form a cartel so that we can control the global prices of lithium. The idea itself is not far-fetched. It all depends on how it's structured and who comes into that circle. If the DRC, Zambia, Chile, Indonesia, the United States, Peru, and Canada were to form a cartel, it gives them power, right? The power of start talking in one voice with these developed nations that have clout on the international stage. If, however, it's presented as us versus them type of thing, then it can create a lot of animosity, uh, so to speak, between the great north and the rich and the poor and so on. One of Zimbabwe's biggest challenges to reaching its full potential seem to be its politics and the narratives that surround it. The narrative on Africa is still a narrative that dates from the 15th century. So that lens then through which you look at Africa is murky. You don't see value, you don't see return for your money, you see all the risks, but not the upside. That needs to be changed. So since colonial times, mining has always played a significant role in Zimbabwe's economy. Zimbabwe has not been able to leverage the kind of mineral resources that it has. I know in terms of when people talk about mineral riches in Africa, they talk about South Africa, Ghana, and DRC, but Zimbabwe has loads of minerals. There is massive potential for the country to really generate hundreds of billions from its remaining mineral endowment. The elephant in the living room is corruption, nepotism, politicization, securitization, and militarization of our natural resources. But I think if the government appoints the right people into the right positions and create the conducive environment for professionalism to thrive in the sector, I'm very certain that Zimbabwe has the capacity to maximize the potential from its minerals.